Hey guys, welcome to another Friday video. If you're on a budget and you want more than four cores, eight threads, this video is for you. There are lots of options like this system. We have a brand new LGA 1356 motherboard that you can get for around 50 to 60 US dollars. The processor has six cores and 12 threads and it cost me only 43 US dollars. RAM is also super cheap because we can use registered ECC DDR3 memory. So today we're going with a 32 gigabyte dual channel kit that I bought for around 60 US dollars. And we also need a cooler. So we're using the Deep Cool Gamma Archer that you can get for around $10. So all up, you're looking at around 170 US dollars for this combo. So that's great value. So the idea is to save money with these core components and then you have more left over to spend on a faster graphics card. And in many games that are mostly GPU limited, this will give you better overall performance compared to buying a whole system new. And gaming performance is actually pretty decent. In Doom, for example, we are hitting the 200 FPS limit on occasions, Shadow of the Tomb Raider also runs at around 100 fps most of the time and in apex legends we're also getting extremely decent performance it never dips below 60 fps and that's with all the details maxed out in this video we're doing a lot of things we are checking out this x79a socket 1356 motherboard this is the second motherboard we're looking at on the channel so we have something to compare to all the important aspects, but also taking a close look at the VRMs with some very interesting findings. And I also did some BIOS modding so we can actually overclock the RAM. I also tested three different processors and I've now got a fairly good idea of what to recommend and what to avoid. Not every processor is actually uh, going well with this motherboard. And also at a certain point, you're better off going with the LGA 2011 platform. I've also gotten heaps of comments on the last few videos, so I picked up some more games to try out. For example, we will see how this machine runs Metro Exodus, as well as Battlefield 1 on a 64 player map, and much more. In the motherboard box we get an IO shield, there's a SATA cable, and also a AMD fan adapter. This is what I used to use the uh, Deepcool Gamma Archer for this project. Now I got a few questions about this fan adapter. You can buy them separately but most of these Chinese motherboards do come with one included. This one is a different version. Uh, it has a back plate and uses screws to fasten the frame. The motherboard layout is a lot better. The power connectors are in better spots for clean cable management. We also get USB 3 and I tested the uh, two ports at the back as well as the USB 3 header and the performance was just fine. We're also getting a M.2 slot, so connected to the PCI Express lanes on the CPU. Unfortunately, we're not getting the full speed. We're getting 800 megabytes per second. Um, so not quite the full speed of what the M.2 SSD can do but still better than the four SATA port because um, these four SATA ports, they are only SATA 2, so they top out at around 300 megabytes per second. Also, M.2, you can install Windows and boot from it, so that works just fine. So here we have a closer look at the socket area. So LGA 1356 and the mounting holes, uh, they are exactly the same position as 1366. So you can use any 1366 cooler with these motherboards. With the processors, you have a choice between the Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge generation. The Ivy Bridge are more modern, 22 nanometers, so they'll run uh, cooler and quieter, consume less power. They also clocked a little bit higher. They are marked with a V2 at the end of the model number, and those are the chips I recommend that do cost a little bit more, but uh, I do not recommend going with any of the Sandy Bridge processors. They consume quite excessively more power. Uh, the TDP is a little bit misleading, and let's have a closer look at what I mean. So the 2430V2 has 6 cores, 12 threads, and a 2.8 GHz all-core turbo speed, and also a rather low TDP of only 80 watts. So it runs cool and quiet, running a CPU stress test. 
I'm seeing temperatures around 50 watts. That's with the deep cool gamma archer. And I also had a look at measuring the VRMs and also in the 50s. So yep, nice temperatures. And that's really why I like recommending this processor. It's got a great mix of a fairly affordable price. You get your six cores and it doesn't consume a lot of power. So it's a really well balanced processor for this motherboard. I also tried a few processors from the Sandy Bridge generation. So first up, we've got the 2470. This one has eight cores and 16 threads running at 2.8 gigahertz uh, with all cores, but it's built on the 32 nanometer process. The price is fairly good, so you might be tempted to get this processor, but stay tuned. On paper, it has a TDP of 95 watts. So compared to the 80 watts, that's only 15 watts more, so it doesn't sound too bad, but unfortunately this is highly misleading. I found the actual power consumption at the wall with a power meter to be much higher. To give you an example, running Cinebench R20 on the 6 core 2430 V2, I saw a power reading of basically uh, 100 watts, 98 was the exact figure, but on this uh, 2470, we saw 164 watts. So that's 66 more watts in power consumption. And this was just too much for the Gamma Archer. The temperatures ran out of control over 90 degrees. So I had to switch over to the Gamma X300. The VRMs also couldn't handle the higher load. Here we have a photo, they're running at over 100 degrees and running the Blender benchmark, it was too much for the entire system. It did an emergency shutdown. And yep, at that point, I knew that this CPU is just not recommended for these motherboards. However, it was nice to see that these motherboards do have safety features built in and that the motherboard actually uh, sent a shutdown signal to the power supply. So at least we have confirmed that there is uh, some safety built in with these motherboards. Now at this point you might be saying, well, that's an eight core processor, obviously it's gonna consume a lot more power. So I tried a fairly equivalent six core processor, it's the E52440. So this one has a slightly lower all core turbo speed of 2.7 gigahertz, but it's basically the equivalent to the 2430 V2 and the TDP is also 95 watts on paper. So running Cinebench, we're seeing a power consumption of 125 watts. So 25% uh, or 25 watts higher than the Ivory Bridge version, which is also running a little bit higher. Looking at the VRMs, we are also seeing higher temperatures around the 70s, not hitting 80, but uh, in the high 70s or so. So still uh, okay but definitely a lot higher compared to the Ivy Bridge CPU. I got a few comments about trying tools such as the Intel Extreme Tuning Utility and Throttle Stop to see if we can overclock the processor. Uh, there is just no way. Uh, you cannot change the multiplier in any way, shape or form. You can only lower it with Throttle Stop if that's something you're interested in. You can't change the uh, bus clock or anything like that. There is no overclocking whatsoever. Uh, on this motherboard and with the Xeon processors. On LGA 2011, there you can buy some unlocked CPUs and you can do some overclocking, but on LGA 1356, whatever CPU you buy, uh, the rated performance, that is what you're gonna get. With the RAM, you can use your regular desktop memory, but you can also use server memory, uh, registered ECC memory, and the prices are a lot cheaper. So if you've got existing RAM lying around, you can use that. But if you're looking at buying some new RAM, uh, definitely go for registered ECC memory. The prices are a lot cheaper. You need a dual channel RAM kit. The platform itself, the processors do support triple channel memory, but these Chinese motherboards only give you dual channel. So to get the maximum memory bandwidth, you should definitely get 1600 megahertz uh, RAM, or at least have a go at overclocking the RAM to 16 megahertz if you have slower rated memory. You can buy cheap registered ECC memory from China, but that can be quite sketchy. For example, this is a 1600 megahertz uh, 16 gigabyte RAM kit and I had a look I uh, removed the cooler and uh, the actual chips are rated at only 1333 so I put in a dispute but didn't have a chance 
Um, even AliExpress stepping in, I didn't get any refund whatsoever. I basically couldn't prove that this is counterfeit. Um, the good news is, however, that the RAM does work and all the RAM I've bought from China does actually work. They just um, doing some tricks with removing the stickers and changing the SPD programming. So yeah, basically they do work, but it's a little bit sketchy. While testing out different RAM sticks, I noticed that they're all running at 1333 MHz. There's a BIOS option to 4600, but that wasn't working. So I got a comment uh, on one of my previous YouTube videos and I got referred to a Russian website, Xeon E5450. What a great name for a website. This is my favorite Xeon for the LGA771 platform that you can mod to use on a Core 2 Duo motherboard. And yeah, there I found a guide to modify the BIOS and unlock the RAM overclocking. So I followed the guide and that worked beautifully. I flashed the modified BIOS and I could go into the BIOS, overclock the RAM to 1600 megahertz, and now that is working as uh, expected. So if you're running into the same situation, um, I have uploaded my BIOS onto, I think it's a Google Drive folder. I'll put that down below in the description. But if you uh, don't want to use that, I will also link the guide down below so you can follow that yourself and patch the BIOS yourself. What else is going on with the motherboard? We have a PCI Express 16 slot. This one is PCI Express 3.0. There's also a PCI Express 1X slot here. We have a four pin uh, fan header. This one does support PWM. You can set the speed in the BIOS. There's an option for that. There's another fan header down here. This one is also four pin, but this one didn't let me control the speed. It just runs at full blast. We've got a SPDIF. Uh, connector here for digital audio out. I could not get that to work. Front panel audio header is here and we also have a USB 2 header here and a USB 3 header is over here. Uh, here you can clear the CMOS to reset uh, the buy settings. Front panel connector with the usual Gigabyte or ASUS uh, layout, so fairly straightforward to use. We have a sound chip from Realtek the USB 3 is from Wire. The Gigabit Ethernet is also from Realtek. For SATA ports, only SATA 2. And let's have a look at the ports. So we have two PS2, four USB 2, two USB 3, and 7.1 audio out. And here we have the voltage regulation, and there's no cooling, but there are some mounting holes here. So maybe there's a sort of a VRM cooler that fits exactly this size. If you know anything, do share your uh, expertise down below in the comments. And because there's no cooling, that's really why I firstly recommend the Ivy Bridge 2430 V2, but that's also why I recommend a top-down cooler like the Gamma Archer. At least you get some sort of an airflow um, around this area, including a bit of airflow onto the RAM modules as well. Something else I noticed, and I forgot to mention that in my previous videos, if you use a tool that can uh, read the temperature sensors uh, on the motherboard, there will be a few readings uh, over 100 degrees, and that's just a glitch. I don't know if they just haven't connected certain pins or whatnot. Maybe they didn't ground them and they just uh, float, so to speak. But don't be alarmed. Uh, it's not the VRMs <laughs> at all. Uh, this happens in winter when everything is idle. It's just a glitch, uh, so just ignore those high readings. We will look at benchmarks and some games soon to make sure that we are evaluating the processor and the motherboard without any bottlenecks. I'm using SSDs, so I got some cheap SSDs from China. These are two one terabyte SSDs. They only cost me 70 US dollars each. And to combine the capacity, I'm using this nifty adapter from StarTech, which lets me configure them in a RAID 0 configuration. I do understand the risks, but yep, I'm happy. Uh, this is not something that has to be super reliable. If any of these drives fail, it's not the end of the world. I'll just quickly reinst reinstall Windows and load a few games. I'm using a Radeon RX 580, the 580 and the RX 570. These are the best value video cards at the moment, be it 
used or new. But it's not the fastest graphics card. Um, so in most of the games that we're testing today, it will bottleneck the system at 1080p. I'll give you an example. Here we have Hitman 2 with high details at 1080p. And we're only getting around 65 FPS. So you might be thinking, well, that's not really that impressive. It doesn't really show what the CPU is actually capable of doing. So let's switch to 720p and we're now getting just under 100 FPS. And this is why I tested 720p. It reduces the GPU bottleneck and it better shows what the processor and the system can do without me having to shell out huge amounts of money to buy like a 2080 Ti that most um, reviewers use when they evaluate a processor. Now, not every game is going to be GPU limited on this platform. Here we have Far Cry 5 at 1080p and we're getting a bit over 70 FPS with high details and the video card is showing around 80% usage. So here the processor, specifically the rather low clock speed is holding things back. And we can confirm this by switching to 720p and we can see that the performance basically hasn't changed. We're still getting a little bit over 70 FPS exactly the same performance as with 1080p because in this game the processor clock speed is the bottleneck. So in short I'm testing at 720p to reduce the GPU bottleneck and better showcase the potential of the system and the processor. And now let's have a closer look at some games. First up we have Doom, high details, a Vulcan API and runs beautifully. Sometimes we're hitting the 200 FPS cap of the engine but most of the time it's around 150 fps so extremely well playable battlefield 1 this is a new addition also running at high details this is on a 64 player map and yeah in youtube videos i had a look this game seems to struggle on quad core processors well good news Thanks to the 6 cores and 12 threads, we are getting pretty solid performance. I don't believe it ever dropped below 60 FPS. So even in busy areas, we are staying around the 70 to 80 FPS. So yeah, well playable on this machine. The next game is Metro Exodus. So I picked it up through the Microsoft Xbox Game Pass PC. Only a dollar for the first month, so how could I resist? downloaded it overnight and I haven't played it much um, but it's got gorgeous graphics very cinematic and yeah seems to be a good stress, stress test for a uh, graphics card and yep also runs silky smooth on this machine never under 60 fps so yep that's also a game that you can play really well on this processor Forza 4 wouldn't work with MSI Afterburner so we just got the FPS counter in the top right corner also testing with high details and yep no complaints silky smooth doesn't drop below 60 FPS another game that runs really nice on this machine Ark Survival Evolved so that's the first time testing this game it's got some weird resolution options it seems to be using some form of integrated scaling and yeah, it's extremely taxing on the video card. So we're testing once again at 720p. And also noticed it seems to have a 60 FPS cap. And most of the time it does run fairly smooth at around 60 FPS. There are a few dips below 58 or 57 or something like that. And I have found a few tweak guides to um, edit some files and remove the FPS cap. But because I got this game through the Microsoft Store, uh, the actual folder where the game is located is, yeah, it's locked. I can't access it. So if you know what I'm talking about and you have a way of getting around that, please share it down below in the comments. Apex Legends also runs extremely well. This is with all the details maxed out and we're getting well over 60 FPS more uh, most of the time. And yeah, sometimes around 100. So yep, another game that is extremely playable on this machine. I've been asked to look at simulation games. I really didn't know what to go for. The only simulation game I found was Mud Runner. Um, so here we're running at 1080p. The game is capped at 60 FPS, very likely because of the physics engine. So we can't really see how far this machine can push it. But yep, at 1080p, it runs silky smooth at a locked frame rate. So another game that runs really well on this platform. Shadow of the Tomb Raider, again high details and I'm testing with high details in pretty much all the games. 
Um, I often found that when you use medium details, it will actually tax the processor less. So I want to put more stress on, onto the CPU, that's the point. So 100 FPS most of the time, but there are some, demo, there are some more demanding scenes where the FPS does go down to around 60 FPS, but most of the time it will be comfortably over 60 FPS. Hitman 2, also a very smooth experience. Excellent FPS throughout the game. There are some more demanding scenes here and there, but it still manages to stay above 60 FPS all of the time. So guys, I think the value of this system is excellent. This particular motherboard is also a lot easier to recommend. We've got a much better layout, so you can build something with neat cable management in mind. We also get USB 3 out of the box, and the addition of the M.2 slot is also nice. Although it's capped at 100 megabytes per second, this is still a huge improvement over these other two ports on these motherboards. Now, with the choice of processor, and now having tested a few different CPUs, I feel a lot more confident in what I can recommend. So it is still the E52430 V2. So that CPU is a sweet spot. We have six cores, 12 threads. It's got a high enough clock speed for most games and it has low power consumption. So the processor runs cool and quiet and the VRMs are also uh, looked after. Now, if you do want faster performance, either higher clock speed or more cores, you should uh, ditch the socket 1356 and go straight to LGA 2011. First, the motherboard, yeah, they are more expensive. So you're looking at around $80. So that's uh, $30 more, but the processors are cheaper. For example, if you look at the eight core um, for the uh, 2450 V2 for LGA 1356, that CPU costs around $100. But the 2650 V2, which is for LGA 2011, costs only around $30. So the motherboards are $30 more expensive, but you're saving 30 bucks on the processor. And with the LGA 2011 platform, you get quite a few benefits. You get double the memory bandwidth, thanks to quad-channel memory. You also get uh, yeah, better built motherboards with VRM cooling. The CPUs have a lot more PCI Express lanes, so you can get boards with, with, that have more PCI Express slots to begin with. Also, M.2 will run at full speed and you will always get at least one SATA 3 port. And as we've seen in the tests, I cannot recommend going with the older Sandy Bridge CPUs, the larger 32 nanometer process. That just means they consume a lot more power and you can't trust the TDP rating on the data sheets, it doesn't really reflect true power consumption. And as we saw, uh, the Sandy Bridge processors, they consume quite a lot more power, so the CPU will run hotter, the VRMs will be uh, stressed a lot more, and the eight core processor altogether was too much for this motherboard with it shutting down automatically to protect itself. So what's coming next to the channel? I want to check out this Plex HDX79 Turbo motherboard. So this one is for Socket 2011. And I bought an unlocked processor. So we will check out overclocking and what sort of performance we can extract out of these Chinese motherboards. As always, guys, if you have any questions and comments, leave them down below. I do read every comment and I can see many of you are just as excited that we can get more than four cores for a good price. And hopefully with the new Ryzen 3000 CPUs, older Ryzen's will hit the used market, which should have a flow on effect on used Xeon processors as well. I will see you next week with our Friday video, but do keep an eye out for Tuesday. Sometimes there will be a bonus video. And that's it guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Give it a like and click on that notification bell. And I shall see you soon with another one.